All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be our next video on environmental science and specifically going through and looking at bird anatomy. Let's get started on this next video. So what is a bird? Well, a bird is a warm-blooded egg-laying vertebrate distinguished by the possession of feathers, wings, and a beak, and it's typically going to be able to fly. So when we look at birds, we might think of these types of common birds that we see in our local area. But there's all sorts of other types of birds around the globe that have very unique shapes, colors, feathers, and anatomy. So when we go through and talk about the physiology of these birds, the adaptions that these birds have, and how these birds go through and interact with their ecosystem, we want to go through and think about some of the bodily functions that they have in order to understand how we will go through and do bird watching. So when we go through and classify birds, well, they're going to be in the kingdom Animalia. They're going to be in the phylum Chordata. They're going to be in the class Aves. And then we're also going to have order, family, genus, and species, which is going to be dependent upon the bird. Now the class is actually closely related to ancestral species of reptiles. Birds are actually fairly close in the remnants and the phylogeny to the dinosaurs. So when we go through and think about the class, well, we want to also think about how these birds are also related to reptiles. Now there's three sets of anatomy that we're going to go through. The most common one that we see and the most distinguishing feature among the birds are the feathers and the colors of the feathers. Now if we look at the head of the bird, we're going to see a few things. At the very top, we see the crown, the forehead, the supercilum, the auriculars, the malar region, and the throat. And each of these groups of feathers is going to have different color patterns dependent upon the species. And we'll use that to go through and identify birds. On the back of the neck, we also see the nape and the mantle. Now, as we go through and look at the right side of this bird here, we can see we have the chest, the belly, the flank, the undertails, and the tail here. And each of these sets of feathers, again, is going to allow us to go through and distinguish different species. But we can break down the side of the bird and the chest of that bird into chunks. And then as we move up to the wings here, we can see the upper tail, the rump, secondaries, primaries, and underwing here. And again, all of these different feathers serve different purposes in flight. And they also serve different purposes for insulation, allowing the birds to adapt and interact with their environment. Now, underneath these feathers, we're going to see the skin of a bird. If you've ever gone through and looked at a Thanksgiving turkey, you're looking at this skin. Now, the two most distinguishing features on the head are going to be the beak, and then we have the outer ear. As we move down, we have the podethka and the pertle. And then down here at the very bottom, we're going to see the oil gland. Now, along the actual wing here, we can see that we have the feather shaft and the apteria. And these are going to be distinguishing features that we see along the bird. Now the skin's going to be what allows the feathers to go through and interact with the actual bird. So the skin's actually holding on to those feathers and those feathers are anchored into the skin of that bird. So when we go through and think about the skin and the feathers, although we don't see the skin normally, they're going to go through and hold those feathers in there and be important for like also insulation, but allowing that bird to go through and hold the feathers in there for flight. Now, the most important part is going to be the respiratory system of this bird. Birds have very unique, very distinguishing respiratory systems that we don't see in other animals. At the top, we see the nasal cavity, the pharynx, and the trachea, which is very similar to humans. But as we move down, we're going to see a few different things. We see these air sacs here, cervicular and clavicular air sacs. And we have more air sacs as we move down into the belly and the side region. And we have one more air sac at the abdomen or the kind of close to the tail here. Now these air sacs are going to interact with the lung and they're going to be important for respiration. Birds are going to have a very unique respiration system that is different than how we breathe as human beings and how a lot of other mammals go through and breathe. So each of these clavicular, cervicular, anterior, posterior, abdominal air sacs play an important role in allowing the bird to go through and fly at high altitudes, but also allow it to go through and use the oxygen so that way it can maintain energy that is necessary for flight. So in order to understand how birds breathe, we have to understand how we breathe in comparison here. Now we breathe via this two-step process here. We're going to inhale, and then we're going to exhale the waste gases. So when we go through and inhale, we're using our lungs and our diaphragm here. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to intake oxygen. And all oxygen is, it's a life supporting component of the air and it consists of two oxygen atoms here. As we go through and breathe, our lungs are going to intake that oxygen. And that oxygen is going to go through and fill up our lungs. So the oxygen is then transported via the bloodstream, and then we're going to use our mitochondria, et cetera, to go through and inhale and convert that into energy with the food that we consume. Now, the byproducts of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is then going to go through and be transported into our lungs, and we're going to go through and exhale that waste gas out of the lungs back up the trachea, and it's going to be exhaled into the atmosphere there. And remember, carbon dioxide, it's that waste product, and it's just going to be a result of respiration. So this process that we call here, we call it bidirectional. When I say bidirectional, it means that the airflow moves back and forth out of the lungs. So we intake it, inhale through the lungs, exhale, out of the lungs. And we use this process that's called bidirectional. Now birds are going to breathe quite differently. They breathe via a four-step process. So they're going to inhale, they're then going to exhale, and that waste gas is not necessarily going to go outside of the bird's beak yet. They're going to inhale again, and then they're going to go through an exhale. And what they're going to use are these air sacs that we see in their anatomy. So as we go through and look at this, again, the first step we're going to go through, and the bird's going to inhale oxygen. Still going to inhale oxygen like any other organism, but on that first step, the air flows through the trachea and it's going to go into that primary posterior air sac there. So if we're looking at this, this is the anterior thoracic air sac, and then we have our posterior thoracic air sac here. So the oxygen goes through, flows into that air sac. And the second step here is it's going to utilize the lungs here, and we're going to see the bird exhale. And on the first exhale, the air moves from the posterior air sac into the lungs. So we're creating negative pressure here, but on that exhale, it's not actually moving out of the bird's beak. It's moving into the lungs. Now the third step, it's the bird's going to go through an inhale again for a second time. And within the second inhalation, the air moves from the lungs into the anterior air sac. So we can see the air is then going to move into that front air sac there. And then on the fourth exhale, or the fourth step, the second exhale, that second exhalation, the air moves from the anterior air sac back to the trachea and then out of the bird's beak. And that's where we see the carbon dioxide and the waste product being removed from the bird. Now we call this process here unidirectional, and it means that the air moving through the bird's lung is mostly fresh air and has very high oxygen content. Because it's using this cycle and this pattern here of inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, the bird is getting lots and lots of fresh oxygen and more oxygen for its respiratory system. Now, why do birds go through and breathe this way? Well, the higher the altitude, the lower the oxygen content in the air. So if we were to go through and look at a chart here, what we're going to be able to see is altitude in feet, and we can see how much oxygen there is at sea level. The atmosphere consists of about 20.9% oxygen. But we can see as we move up, and up and up to almost 30,000 feet, what we can see is the oxygen content is going to drop to only 6.3%. Now, if any of you guys have seen any of the bombers in World War II, what you'll see is these men that go through and they wear, one, these fleece sheep lined coats that keep them really warm because as they move up, they get really, really cold. It gets really, really cold but you also see them going through and wearing oxygen masks. And those oxygen masks are really, really important and they allowed them to go through and breathe before pressurized cabins. The other thing that we have to go through and think about is the act of flying also requires a lot of energy and therefore more oxygen is required. So as the birds go through and fly, flying requires a lot, a lot of energy. So therefore, as they're going through and consuming food burning calories, they also need the oxygen to go through cellular respiration. So in order to go through and fly, one, as you move up in height, you need to be able to consume that oxygen efficiently. And two, as you are going through and flying as a bird, you need more oxygen in order to go through and ensure that your wings can flap in order to keep you in the air. Now you're probably thinking, well, what birds are going through and flying at 30,000 feet? And there's a few that are going to go through and fly at right around 30,000 feet. A few, not many. 
So what we can see here is this diagram shows sea level to 30,000 feet. And what we're going to see is many goose species, specifically the Canada goose, well these are going to have a flight range of about 3,280 feet. We see that most songbirds are going to fly somewhere around 4,000 feet. We're going to see that ducks and geese can fly somewhere up to 7,000 feet. Eagles and falcons are going to fly anywhere between, you know, 10 to 15,000 feet. And then we see a few sets of birds that go through some swans and cranes that will actually fly 30,000 feet plus. And that's where our jet airliner altitude is. So we can see that these birds, as they move up in these altitudes, they need more oxygen. And because there is less oxygen, the respiratory systems have to be more efficient. All right, so this is going to be the end of the video, but did you guys learn? Well, did you learn a couple of things? Did you guys go through and learn about bird anatomy, the specific parts that we went through and briefly talked about? Did you guys go through and learn about how birds breathe? This, you know, physiology associated with that. Then did you guys go through and learn about why birds have a complicated breathing system? This is going to be the end of the video, but I will see you all in class tomorrow.